hear much about, and that is the privilege, and that's a very dull word to use for it, the privilege of worship. I want to read part of the book of the Revelation in the fifth chapter, Revelation 5, reading from verse 1. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book, written within on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, <clears throat> Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And no man in heaven or earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, a lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book, and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, to the lamb as had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seal thereof, for thou, thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God out of, by thine own blood out of thy every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Some years ago, as a matter of fact about 200, so it's before my time, there was a, a biographer in England, he was a kind of, well he, he was partly a biographer and partly a historian, and he was a Christian. And he found out that a businessman in London was going to Scotland not to see the historic site, not to see where the Covenanters were persecuted and buried, but he went to hear preachers. And it was a risk because he went by stagecoach and uh, Edinburgh would be about, I suppose, 250, maybe 300 miles from London and that was a hazardous job. They used to mug people in those days, did you know that? <clears throat> Except the folk were nice, so they wore velvet jackets and they had uh, diamonds on the daggers, so it, it was much more exciting. And uh, yet John Wesley said that though he travelled 240,000 miles, can you imagine that on horseback, and many times at night never once was he stopped by a highwayman. That's a pretty good record, isn't it? Sounds as though God keeps his promise. He'll uh, give his angels charge concerning us. <clears throat> this man by the name of Woodrow, he went to see the man who had been on his wonderful vacation in, London, in Scotland and asked him what he thought about the preaching there. And he said, I went to St. Andrew's Cathedral and I heard a man by the name of Robert Blair and he showed me the majesty of God. Scotland did have, Scotland still has, some of the greatest preachers in the world. I forgot the name of the man who for the moment uh, was offered the chair uh, as the uh, president of one of the most prestigious universities in the world, Edinburgh University, and he turned me down at 40 years of age to just take a pastorate up the road in, a, in the fields amongst a few ordinary, ordinary people. They still have some great giants in the pulpit. And he said, I, I, I went and I heard this marvellous man Blair. He showed me the majesty of God. The next I saw a, a proper old man. Well, old man, he's really proper, but uh, this one was uh, <clears throat> old and he said, well favoured. I suppose he's a little more weight than I have. And he said, I was thinking at the time of the revelation I got from Blair of the majesty of God that David Dixon, I have one of his reprint books, said, he showed me all my heart. Now that's a big come down from seeing the majesty of God. And then he said, I stayed a little longer and I went and heard a little fair man. 
by the name of Samuel Rutherford. <clears throat> Maybe some of you have read his life story. If you haven't, you should get it. He, he, he wasn't the author, but out of his many writings, a lady called Mrs. Cousins wrote that hymn, The Sands of Time Are Sinking, The Dawn of Heaven Breaks. He has a lovely stanza in that hymn in which he says, I, I've never noticed if this is true, I've checked. <clears throat> the bride eyes not her garment, but her dear bridegroom's face. I will not gaze on glory, but on the King of grace. Not at the crown he gifteth, but on his pierced hand, when throned where glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. I listened, he said, almost tremblingly to Blair as he showed me the awesome majesty of God. I listened with fear as Dixon unveiled to me my own heart. But I listened with my eyes just swollen and my face running with tears as Samuel Rutherford showed me the loveliness of Christ. Now maybe when you've been to church Sunday morning you'll be able to check up and see which revelation you got from your preacher. Would it be the loveliness of Christ? Would it be that he took you by your fingers and took you down into the deep parts of your being? That is one uh, man death to say, search all my heart, the secret springs, the motives that control, the chambers where polluted things hold empire over the soul. Search till thy fiery glance hath cast its holy light through all, and I by grace am brought at last before thy face to fall. I'm afraid very often we go out of church as we went in, don't you think so? There's been no deep impact on our spirit, we're not eternity conscious anymore, we've not been bathing in the, in the great revelation of the holiness of God. You know, as we were singing tonight, Crown Me With Many... I love that hymn, not because it's English, but Matthew Bridges wrote it, Crown Me With Many Crowns. And you know, as, as, I, as I sang that, I thought, one day God is going to take vengeance on every sinner in the world. For everybody who's blasphemed the name of Jesus today, for everyone who's cheated on his name, who called themselves by his name, and we're not to take the name of the Lord our God in vain. That doesn't mean on your lips. It means if you profess to be a Christian and you do a, a substandard act, you've taken his name in vain. Because somebody says, if that's Christianity, I don't want it anyhow. I still believe the most awesome thing in the world, in this twisted rotten age in which we live, is to profess to be a Christian. Now one day God is going to take vengeance on this world. I can't wait. I've been waiting over 70 years, nearly uh, 76 now, and you know, it gets more exciting as I get nearer the goal. <laughs> I used to have a, an assistant pastor, and he would say at the end of the day, Well, Brother Len, a day's march nearer home. That's an old hymn, you won't remember that many of you. <clears throat> a day's march nearer home. Three things in the life of a Christian. Number one, one exercise is prayer, which again is preoccupation with our needs. Praise, which is preoccupation with our blessings. And worship, which is preoccupation with God. Remember Jesus met that woman at the well and she was worshipping, he didn't argue about that. But he said, you worship, you know not what. We're commanded at least twice in two great psalms to worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. In the 45th psalm, the psalmist says, All thy garments, and he's speaking of Jesus Christ, all thy garments smell of myrrh and of aloes and of cassia. Now there's a mixture for you. Pungent, aromatic, almost take your breath away, indeed they would take your breath away, but he's considering the beauty of Christ. You see, he appeals on the, on the level that we poor mortals live. We see things, we smell things, we taste things, oh, taste and see. He says that the Lord is good. Now, the Lord, as we've reminded ourselves during the, these days, at least... In the European concept of worship, usually we stand to sing all hymns. The, the, uh, 
A visitors to America can never understand why we sit down all the time. <coughs> well, we're always sitting in our cars, we sit at home, so why not sit in church? But I'll tell you an advantage of standing. If you're sitting, you can be looking around like this, but if you're standing, somehow you concentrate more. So, we stand to sing, and we kneel to pray, and we prostrate ourselves to worship. At least we should. In one of my many private interviews with Dr. Tozer, he said to me one day, Len, let others do as they like. You and I will worship God face downward. Not far from where I lived, in, in England, there's a little place called Burstall. There's a room there. Uh, it didn't look much longer than this <laughs> back door. Maybe it was ten by ten by ten by ten. It hadn't got a window in it. And it was used by an associate of John Wesley, a man by the name of John Nelson. And he would not have any windows in his study because they'd distract, he said. He might look at the birds or the flowers or somebody else. So he shut himself up in that little room. He had a chair a bit higher than this with a hard back and it had a shelf at the back. That wasn't to serve his meal on either. He carried that to the village and he turned the chair around and he preached and put his Bible on the back of it. And he said one day some men knocked him out of the chair and they had clogs. They have a, a brass cap on the toe and they have ribs of iron underneath and he said they jumped on me and jumped on my chest and said, we'll kick the Holy Ghost out of you. And he said, I was very sore, but I just got up and prayed, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> Most of us would expect somebody to write a book about us. <clears throat> but anyhow, that was the way of life. But he did not want any distraction or subtraction. Now, we mentioned, was it last time we were here, we mentioned about the woman who brought an alabaster box of ointment which was very precious, and she came, in my judgment, just for one thing. She came to worship the Lord. How do you get to that conclusion? Because, number one, she never said a word. Number two, she brought the most costly thing that she had. And worship is costly. And true worship means, it's a combination, as far as I'm concerned, it's a combination of concentration and adoration, and contemplation, and meditation, and fascination. Adoration is excessive praise, delirious joy. Now, come on, let me put you under some pressure here. When last were you deliriously joy with the reality of the risen Son of God? Oh, it's easy to say we have a home eternal in the heavens, not made with hands. So what? Supposing you had a mansion somewhere in uh, this great state of uh, uh, Dallas, I was going to say, this great state of Texas, and you were going to inherit everything you wanted to run it, and you were going to be able to live there for a hundred years with servants and every adequate thing that you needed, I think you might get a little excited about it. We have a home eternal in the heavens, prepared, according to John 14 again, prepared by none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. Now I said we fall down, we fall down to worship. Right through the book of Revelation, if you want to take these down you can do it or you can get a tape on this. You, you get this again, I'm not going to give you the quotes, just the scriptures, Revelation 1.17. Revelation 5.8, Revelation 5.14, Revelation 7.11, Revelation 11.16, Revelation 19.4, and Revelation 22.8. And you remember perhaps in Genesis 17 there came a servant, there came somebody rather, in dazzling splendor to the tent that Abraham was in, and Abraham fell down at his feet. Jesus went into the upper room at his resurrection and again they fell down at his feet. There's an experience in grace which I guess most of us have had, I hope so, called justification. That's God in his infinite mercy when we've repented of our sins and asked his forgiveness, he, he er eradicates all the record of our sin and, and to, to play on a word as we do to children sometimes, sometimes, 
justification is just as if I'd never done it. He's wiped the record free. But here is justification, and sanctification is as high above justification as justification is above the sinner's state. By the same token, there's an experience in God, an experience of prayer. And prayer is on this level, but intercession is as high above, above, above inter, uh, intercession is as high above prayer as um, adoration is above praise. I don't think many people ever enter into this experience, to tell you the truth. Worship is my conscience quickened by the holiness of God. Um, worship is my response to the activation of the Spirit in my heart. Therefore, if I'm dull of comprehension about the things of God, he's not going to provoke me, he can't provoke me, because I don't have the spiritual susceptibility to respond to the things that God is saying in his word. Now, I don't know how you get on with the book of the Revelation, it still mystifies me. To me, it's a book of mystery, it's a book of majesty, and it's a book of misery. Because it shows me the ultimate doom of the wicked. You know, somebody has said, I've said this before maybe, that in this day in which we live, there are just three kinds of people in the world. Those who are afraid, those who don't know enough to be afraid, and those who know their Bibles. How in the world do people get through a world like this unless they have a foundation that cannot be shaken? Remember at the end of Hebrews 11, everything that can be shaken will be shaken, that the kingdom that cannot be shaken may remain. God is going to break up this universe, he's going to break up all world systems, in order that he may glorify his Son. Everybody has owed their life to Jesus Christ, whether they're living or, or they've been dead a thousand years, they owe that life to God. And at the end of the journey, he's going to make everybody pay for their deficiencies, for their sin, for their selfishness, for everything else that, that just jammed up their lives instead of yielding that life to God. Now, I, I think this is one of the most awesome chapters in the book of the Revelation. Revelation 5, I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. Notice the angel, I notice the strong angel crying with a loud voice, Thirteen times in the book of the Revelation it mentions crying with a loud voice. There's nothing secretive about it. This is everything as we sing in an old hymn, or we used to sing in an old hymn. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. It's going to be some day when God blows out the sun. When God brings every army, every government, every system to a standstill, that finally we may stand there before his eternal throne. It's breathtaking to see this, because I think, of all the things in eternity, this is one of the most awesome things. An angel proclaims with a loud voice and says, Who is worthy to look on the book, to open the book, and to lose the seal thereof? Now, no man in heaven or earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book. Now, what is the book? In my judgment, the book is the title deeds of the universe. They were forfeited by, by Adam when he sinned. And the scripture is very clear that this world is in the lap of the evil one. The scripture calls him the prince of this world. The scripture calls him the god of this world. And it says there was no man who was found worthy to open the book. You know, men have tried to put this world back together again so many times. As I said to you before, that nursery rhyme... You know, you quote it so easily to children, uh, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. That's theology. Do you wonder the child didn't understand it? You don't, so why, how could he understand it? Unless I told you, of course, you've been illuminated. <clears throat> but Humpty Dumpty is actually, is mankind for, it's a p picture of an egg, of course, and Humpty Dumpty falls off the wall and, uh, as we say so often, anybody can scramble eggs, who can unscramble them? 
Once there was a fall, the fall of man, Humpty Dumpty fell off and broke to pieces and we've been trying to put him back together again. The Babylonians said they'd do it. Remember that great city of Babylon was built at the, uh, by permission of Alexander the Great? The king at that time, the king of Babylon, had a wife who uh, was used to living in mountains. And uh, it was very flat. So you may remember anyhow, not the fact, but you remember the historic fact that he had a mountain built in the middle of the city for her. And one of the seven wonders of the world, at least the old world, I don't know about today, but one of the seven wonders of the world was the hanging gardens that were the hanging gardens of Babylon. And Babylon thought it could put mankind together again. And it ended up in all its devouring. It's a slur now to say, say of cities like Babylon. They couldn't do it. The Greeks thought they could do it with their intellectual splendor. And yet, you know, most of those leading Greeks, those scholars that we are always talking about, were homosexuals. And Greece couldn't put it back together again. And then Rome came with its strong arm. My dear sweetheart and I used to live in the city of Bath in England. It was founded in 55 BC. There's a bath there, the only hot spring in, in England. And around it you have the statues of Tiberius Caesar and Julius Caesar and Caligula and all the other famous guys. But they couldn't put it right again. You know, in 1912, there was a class of people in England called the Fabian Socialists. And I remember every time we picked up newspapers, or my folk did, and I heard people talking, they were talking about H.G. Wells, a red-bearded rebel by the name of um, George Bernard Shaw, Julian Huxley, the Webbs, just a, an elite group of super-intellectuals, who in 1912 said, we can put the world right. We don't need the church or the Bible or Christ. We can pull down the hills of wealth, fill in the valleys of poverty, make the crooked places. We can change the world by intellectual and biological processes. That was two years before World War I. At the end of the World War I, 1919, they weren't very sure. 1919 to 1939, 20 years in which the church, I believe, had the greatest opportunity she's had since Pentecost and she muffed the whole thing. 1939, up came, up came Hitler. Remember Nostradamus had said that in 1939, he said in the 1500s, there'll be a war in Europe led by a man by the name of Hister. Well, he wasn't far out. I'll give him an A- minus for that. Not Hister, he said. It would be Hister, but it was Hitler. And we had a war till 1945. And at the end of the war in 1945, the man who was going to put the world right by intellectual and biological processes and changing the educational system. By 1945, he wrote his last book, Mind at the End of Its Tether, he said, and he said there's no hope for humanity. What a dismal thing. He'd written his outline of the world history. He'd written Crux and Father that got him into trouble with the Roman Church. But you see, these men have all felt that somehow... You remember Swinburne? Glory to man in the highest, for man is the master of things. And there are some people still foolish enough to think that somehow we're going to pull, to say again, a rabbit out of the bag. Human nature is totally incurable. We were down in an area, I won't say where it is, I might get into more trouble. But it's where all the millionaires came in the yacht. The Christian brother came in his yacht. One and a quarter million dollars. Heaven helped him at the judgment seat. He ripped a sail. The sails cost half a million dollars on that soupy yacht. Had a crew of 23. You know, I looked around those folk, I didn't envy them one thing. Not one thing. They rushed to the taverns at night, they run to the dance halls at night. They could not find comfort. They're just, just mesmerized, like so many Christians are, with materialism. You know, when I sing a hymn like Cranberry with many crowns, I never sing it through. I always think of my good friend John there, he likes that hymn. Cranberry with many crowns. Come in the Lord of peace. People say today, we've lived so long through so many wars. Is there no answer? Sure there's an answer. The answer is in, in the Prince of Peace. The answer is in the greatest remedy that was ever given to man in the Sermon on the Mount. The most majestic thing ever uttered by the most majestic man who ever lived. 
Have you ever wondered how it is that world, the world can accept you so easily when it couldn't accept him? The holiest man that ever lived never did one wrong thing all his life and yet they were booting him, kicking him around, spitting on him, cast him out of his home, cast him out of the synagogue and yet you and I somehow expect to be treated so nice, so comfortable. There's an old hymn that says, Is this vile world a friend to grace to help me on to God? You see, the scripture is very explicit and I can't preach it all obviously, but it says if we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Now all of life is over. Here in this fifth chapter. Here's somebody on the throne, he has the title deeds of the universe, and no man, listen to it, no man. Don't you think Alexander the Great could do that? He conquered the world by the time he was 27. What about some of these great men down here? What about Hezekiah and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel? What about the Apostle Paul? Surely here's a he-man, here's a strong man in the spirit. Can't he walk up, can't he volunteer and bow the knee and say, Jesus, I'll take the book out of your hand, or the one on the throne. And he says, no man was found worthy. And then he says, I wept much. You know that word is only used twice. The Greek word there, wept. It isn't somebody who's just feeling a little hurt. And it, it, it's somebody weeping with anguish. It's the same word that's used of Jesus when he looked at a city called Jerusalem and he's saying in his heart, you mad, insane people. Almighty God has given you the greatest men that ever lived. You've had Isaiah, you've had Jeremiah, you've had major prophets, you've had minor prophets, and you've destroyed every one of them. All oh, Jerusalem now that killeth the prophets. And he went over its stupidity. You tell your preacher from me that a wet-eyed preacher will never preach dry sermons. The trouble people come to the altar without being broken is the preachers are not broken. And they've no right to demand brokenness unless they're broken. In God's name, is there anything more exciting, is there anything great in the world to preach than the gospel of the grace of God? Oh, I had a couple of fellows came to see me this week. They rubbed my nose in the dust. They didn't know they were doing it. One was going to come back tonight, he hasn't come, but he's living in Tyler now. He's a young man from India, God told him to come here and link up, and I hope we can link up with him. God gave him a vision, there in poor India, the, the 24th of April next year, better put it down there, Betty and the other Betty and all the rest of you. 24th of April next year is to be a day of prayer and fasting for worldwide revival. Great. He said, look, I've got a letter here from Dr. Cho. Dr. Cho is preaching, I think, this week, actually, in Dallas. He's the man who has a nice little church there in Korea, in Seoul. It has 250,000 members. Huh. I don't think that's a church, that's a de denomination. <laughs> 250,000 people. And he showed me the letter in which he said, Brother John, I cannot be in the prayer meeting myself, but we shall pray with you because every night in our church, every night of every day in the year, upon me, every night in the year is a whole night of prayer in our church. Dear God, do you know a church in America where they pray all night once a week? When I was a boy, we used to pray for career in all its heathen darkness and superstition and all that. And now they have prayer meetings every night in the week. And then they have a prayer mountain with about 4,000 people on the prayer mountain every night in the week. Oh, I felt like saying, could you shut up for a minute? We build our churches, why in God's name do we build them so big? A lady wrote me this week, we're going to build an auditorium, a new auditorium, seating 9,000 people. For what? To use it an hour, Sunday morning, because you can be sure of it in life. If they have 9,000 Sunday morning, they won't have 1,000 Sunday night. If you want to know how popular the church is, you go Sunday morning. If you want to know how popular the preacher is, you go Sunday night. 
Do you want to know how popular God is? You go to the prayer meeting. <clears throat> and he loses every time. Well, that was part of my misery. The other misery was a man came in from Africa, had been in Nigeria. I said, how are things there? Oh, Brother Raymond, you'd love to go to Nigeria. He said, if the service starts at seven o'clock, the congregation comes at five. <laughs> Two hours, they come in their hundreds and they pray and they worship and they have their adoration and man, you... <sighs> oh, mercy, anybody could preach there. An atmosphere prepared for two hours with prayer and intercession and, and supplication and, and, and expectation. Do you know why so often nothing happens when we go to church? Because we have no expectation. It's going to be like some, last Sunday, pretty dry, and your faith rewarded. <coughs> <laughs> Does it have to be that way? Are we going to have to take shiploads of our pastors to, to Nigeria? Where people walk ten miles to the meeting? And he said, Brother Rainer, they, they, they pray. Oh, you should hear them pray. Now, you should hear them pray for two hours. Uh, and then the meeting starts at, at, at seven, and then it finishes between nine and ten. And then they slip home, and there's a curfew on the city because they've had some trouble. And he said they slip home and, and leave the wife and children or leave the husband and the children and, and then they slip back to church and you can't go out till six the next morning. So they go back to church at eleven o'clock and they pray till six in the morning. Oh Lord. We kind of want God to bless us because we give him a dollar in the Sunday morning offering. Huh? Lord, you die for me, but I'm not dying for you. We say, Lord, help me to live for you. He doesn't want you to live for him. He wants you to die for him. If he can get you to, to die for him, he'll see about the living part. Won't be any problem about that. Now, come on, here is John. John's in this awesome situation. Oh, look, 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 again. When did you last go to the sanctuary and again... Somebody like Mr. Blair showed you the majesty of God. We very, very, very seldom have an unveiling of God. As I said before, when did you last tiptoe out of the church Sunday morning breathless? Because you'd, you'd had a confrontation with God. Or as I said before, and I say every meeting I go to, did you even come to this meeting tonight? Did you come here to meet God or did you come to hear a sermon about him? Do you go to church actually to have a confrontation with deity, with holiness? Hmm? Or do you go because you're in the choir? Or your daddy's the pastor or a deacon? I mean, is yours really a love relationship? Uh, we, we, we borrow crutches in our, in our worship. Charles Wesley's wonderful hymn, Jesus, lover of my soul. Thou, O Christ, art all I want. Dear God, if he was, we'd turn the world upside down. He isn't all we want. We want so many other periphery things, perishing things of clay, as I think A.B. Simpson called them. John has had a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is he like? Terrible, terrible. Oh, I think when I see him, it'll be wonderful. No, no, no. You sang tonight, Lo, the tokens of his passion, though in glory still he bears. On the resurrection, they didn't know if it was him. He showed them his hands and his feet. They were pierced. And I believe those are eternal, eternal monuments. Every time we see him. Hail thou once despised Jesus, hail thou Galilean King. They're going to see him in all his glory. John laid his head on the bosom of Jesus and heard that divine heartbeat and he knew, you say, God doesn't have favourites. Sure he has favourites. Always did and always will. When he went to the, to the death chamber of Jairus' daughter, he took with him who? Peter, James and John. When he went on the Mount of Transfiguration, he took with him Peter, James and John. And yet it's John who declares that out of Peter, James and John, there was a special affinity between him and the Saviour. 
that disciple whom Jesus loved. And yet that same man who had leaned, he slept with Jesus, eaten with Jesus, fasted with Jesus, cast out demons with Jesus, and every other thing he shared in the majesty of Jesus. And when he sees him in resurrection splendor, he says, I tell you, Peter's dead. Well, they ask you in God's name, what do you think you and I are going to do? Oh, Dr. Dirk tells you, used to say to me, Len, if there's anything that irritates me, these fellows who think they're going to buddy-buddy with Jesus when they see him. I served you for 20 years. I won so many souls. I gave out so many thousands of tracts. I did this, that, and the other. I believe that worship is adoration. I believe it's speechless adoration. John sees him, his hair as white as snow, his feet are like burnished brass, his face is like the sun in its strength, his eyes are like living coals. Can you imagine that? I've heard people say, I don't like to look so and so in the eye. His eyes go right through me. Oh my, his eyes will go right through us in that day. Hmm? Hail thou once despised of Jesus, hail thou Galilean king. The head that once was crowned with thorns is crowned with glory now. God is going to get every bit of praise that he should have had out of every redeemed person. Even though they were not redeemed, he's going to say, well, all that you missed in your lifetime, you're going to have to pay it back in worship and adoration once before you go to eternal hell. I wept much. Isaiah's let me down. Jeremiah's let me down. The Apostle Paul can't do it. Is there no man can do it? No one was found worthy to open the book. And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not, the lion of the tribe of Judah hath prevailed to open the book and loose the seals thereof. And I beheld the six in the low, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, in the midst of the elders, to the lamb as it had been slain. I think that lamb is mentioned 27 times in this marvelous book of Revelation. Well, the book of Revelation is not only the end book, at the end of the book, but it's about things that happen after the end of the book and after the end of time. And I'm sure that this John was there when John Baptist said, Away there in the wilderness, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And he's seen Christ as a sacrificial lamb, as the Passover lamb. Weep not, there's one who has prevailed. And he came, verse 7, and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. That word there, lamb, is very interesting because it's used again in Greek only twice in the New Testament. Lovest thou me? Lord, you know I love thee. Feed my sheep. Lovest thou me? Peter's a bit itchy about this. He doesn't like the pressure. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you really love me? Yes. Feed my lambs. Do you remember in the Old Testament they used to have to keep a lamb for three or four days? They could keep it in the house and then they shed its blood. The actually Greek, I guess here, actually means my pet lamb. My pet lamb alone is able, because he's not only the lamb, he's the lion. I'm told that there's nothing that celebrates, if you want to call it that, celebrate his anger more furiously with, with, with greater power than a, an infuriated ram. It's more fierce than the lion. That is in its air, in its capacity. Jesus Christ is the pet lamb. He is the Passover lamb. He's to take the burden. Think of it. By one man's sin, by one man's disobedience, that was it. No, he didn't commit adultery. Oh, no, he didn't steal. No, he didn't beat somebody up. One man's disobedience. You see, we think people have to commit vulgar sins, horrible sins, sins that you, you couldn't even mention the name. Well, maybe you could these days on TV or something. They're just uh, uh, bloody and horrible, sexual, perversion. Yuck! They almost make you want to throw up. 
And yet the greatest sin in the world isn't one of those. The greatest sin is to say, I rule my life and not let God rule it. You see, this worship, that adoration is so wonderful that one day there was a person in heaven and he was the most glorious cherubim. Every precious stone was his covering. I think he was not only head of the angels, he was head of the cherubim and the seraphim. And when he saw that the angels veiled their faces, the cherubim couldn't look on God. How in the world will you and I look on him? When the sun gets too bright, you put your shades on and say, oh, well, that's more comfortable. Well, angels don't have shades, and so they look through their, they look through their, their wings to gaze upon the Holy One in Isaiah 6. And then with two wings they cover themselves because they couldn't bear the blazing light of God's eyes upon them like his eyes of a flame of fire. The Lamb. Glory, glory dwelleth in Emmanuel's land. And it says here that the, uh, the Lamb came and he took the book. What is the book? Well, uh, the, uh, a sealed book was a standing sign of an alienate, alienated or a, a, a lost territory. Let's put it as simple as that. And unless there's somebody can come forward and take the title deeds out of the one that sits on the throne, and I believe this is the last great thing in eternity, I may be wrong, then we can't enter into our final inheritance. There are two things we've got to get yet. And I'm looking forward to mine. You he-men may not. We're going to have a body like unto his glorious body. My, that will be wonderful, eh? Nobody will check your blood pressure. No angels running around heaven taking your blood pressure, you know. No headaches. Gabriel doesn't come and say, do you want an aspirin this morning? They're going to have a body like unto his glorious body. Won't have any blood in him. Because he left his blood at the cross and he said a body... My body doesn't have blood, it has flesh and bones. He didn't mention blood, he'd left his blood. Am I going to have a body like unto his glorious body? It's a good job we have because, you know, heaven's so wonderful. If we didn't, we'd burst at the seams. Or we'd burst at the veins or something. He came and took the book out of the hand of him that sat upon the throne... Oh, won't it be awesome to see that? It doesn't say we'll fall at his feet, but do you remember Daniel when he saw the, the, the one that appeared to him? He says, all oh, my strength left me. I, I passed out. I'm sure we're going to have a reinforced, a glorious body. John fell at his feet as dead. The woman brought alabaster box of ointment, do you wonder? You know, I wonder, I can't prove this, you can't disprove it, but I, I think maybe that when the Apostle Paul was caught up into the third heaven that he had a vision of all this. I think Moses at a banquet there in Egypt when all the lust and lying and women went topless in those days, what's new under the sun? And, and, and they, 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 they spent days and days at a feast, and they had a vomitarium. When they got full, they tickled their throats and threw it up, and came back and ate, like the Romans did. Um, I don't know how long that marriage supper of the Lamb is going to take, but it's going to be a very, very awesome thing to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and all the saints of all the ages. Just because one day we repented of our sins, and what did we give him? We gave him nothing but corruption, we gave him nothing but failure. We were doomed for a lost eternity. Our names were already reserved in hell, and he, he crossed our names out, and he, he put them in the book of life that nobody can touch. He came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne, and when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down, here you are, they fall down. Notice in verse 10 of the previous chapter, the four and twenty elders all fall down before him that sat on the throne and they worship him. 
They worship him. Again, worship is something that we do face downward. I'm not quite sure that we can worship God in a crowd, to tell you the truth. Have you noticed when they show pictures of the Ayatollah Khomeini and others there in Iraq and other countries, they show you a mosque with hundreds and hundreds of what? Men, no women. And they leave their shoes outside because they won't bring the filth of the world into the holy place. And God says to Moses, take off thy shoes from off thy feet, that's contamination. You've been walking this way, now forget all that, and you come and stand in my holy presence. I believe that when that bush was on fire, it was the Shekinah glory of God that was there. God invaded it. Do you think that Moses ever forgot that vision when he was languishing on that bed with all those heathen? And he renounced what? Because you see, there's a fundamental thing in worship and it is sacrifice. And the Hebrews 11 says he chose rather to suffer affliction with the children of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, choosing the reproach of Christ. Who told him about Christ? Well, I'm convinced the Holy Spirit did. The Spirit that brooded over the face of the waters and out of chaos he brought cosmos. Out of total darkness he brought light. That vision that Moses had, it was easy to surrender after that. Sure, I'm going to preach on it Sunday night. Do you want to come and hear me? I'm going to Oilton, just uh, outside Oral Roberts' place. Oral doesn't, doesn't know I'm going, but anyhow, uh, <clears throat> I'm going up there and I think I'm going to preach on Moses. Coming out of that great kingdom and then 40, 40 weeks? No, no, no. You ever try 40 hours by yourself, shut the door, let nobody in, take the phone off? 40 hours? <sighs> You'll think it's 40 years by the time you're through. Put the cat out, put the dog out, stay by yourself. But not for 40 hours, not for 40 days, not for 40 weeks, for 40 years! Ah, yes, he'd gone down Main Street and the band played and everybody saluted and said, His Excellency Moses, he's the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He's going to be Ramesses III. He's a marvelous genius. Read the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles. He was mighty in word. He wasn't an orator because he stammered, but he was a statesman. He was mighty indeed. He ruled other people. And that man suddenly is transferred from all the excellency in a silken couch and <laughs> somebody using ostrich feathers to keep him cool at night, they had no cooling system. And now he's at the back of the desert with some stinking sheep. Boy, that's a come down, isn't it? Huh? Oh yes, come on now, you stand up and sing almost without a tear or an emotion were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small. Love so amazing, so divine, shall have my soul, my life, my all. Well, you shouldn't put that um, I should mean it, but it didn't say that originally. Demands my soul, my life, my all. Does Christ have to give all and I give him only a measurement of what I have? Am I in control of what I have? I like this great American hymn, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. I preached in that church on Boston Common and asked that we had it because it was written there. My faith looks up to thee. As thou hast died for me, it says, Oh, may my love to thee, pure, warm, and changeless, be a living fire. There's only one way it can be a constant living fire, and that is to gaze on his holiness, gaze on his majesty, gaze on his beauty, to worship him. If we really worship God, we'd never backslide. If you worship God, if you saw through into eternity, you'd never, never, never let anything or anybody get you down. <coughs> You never expect to get good treatment in a world like this, not even from believers very often. If you haven't discovered it, you will discover it. It's easy to stand the criticism of... What does it say in Psalm 1 about the sinners? The uh, criticism of sinners, contradiction of sinners. That's not too bad, you don't expect much else. You get contradiction of sinners, it's criticism of saints that gets you down. 
Particularly when they're trying to choke the way that you're treading with God, when you're treading on a higher elevation, when you've made a, a decision that makes them look a bit shabby because you've made a, a deeper commitment, if you want to put it that way. Let's go back a minute here into this fourth chapter. And verse 6. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes. Actually, that's a bad translation. The real translation is four living ones. They weren't beasts in the sense that we think of animals. Four living ones full of eyes before and behind. And the first living one was like a lion, the second like a calf, the third had the face of man, the fourth was like an eagle. And the four living ones had each of them six wings, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day or night, singing what? Holy, holy, holy is, which was, and is, and is to come. And when those beasts gave, or those living ones gave glory and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who liveth forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fell down before him that sat on the throne, and they worshipped him that liveth forever. Mm, crown him with many crowns, the lamb upon his throne. The four and twenty elders, their eyes are suddenly opened to the majesty of Jesus and they take their crowns and they cast them down. As one hymn writer says, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder and love and praise. And they cast their crowns before him and they worship him that liveth forever and ever. Now, here's an interesting thing. Notice there's a doxology here. If you want to go through these, I'll tell you what they are. In Revelation 5 and verse 6, you'll find a twofold doxology. I'm not going to refer to it except to tell you. Revelation, verse, uh, no, Revelation 1 and verse 6. Revelation 4 and verse 11, a threefold doxology. Revelation 5 and verse 13, a fourfold doxology. And Revelation 7 and verse 12. There's a sevenfold doxology. Let me read that to you. Notice again, all the angels stood round about the throne and the elders and the four beasts. And what did they do? Same old thing. They fell down before the throne. How in the world do we keep standing? Come on, let me ask you this. I feel a bit of anger almost in my... How in the world can church be so dead and preaching be so boring with a God like this to glorify? Why in God's name are we going to eternity every Sabbath day and forget the stinking world around us and come out with a perfume of eternity upon us? Within the veil, Frida Hanbury Allen says, within the veil, for only as thou gazest upon the matchless beauty of his face, canst thou become a living revelation of his great heart of love, his untold grace. Within the veil, his fragrance poured upon thee. The woman took the alabaster box of ointment, she washed his feet with tears, not water, dried the feet with the hair of the head, not a towel, poured the ointment upon him that was worth a king's ransom, and then she dried his feet with the hair of the head. What happened? The fragrance she poured out on him came back on her. Doesn't that sound a bit like the folk in the Acts of the Apostles? They took knowledge of them that been with Jesus. Do you think anybody ever gasps when we leave church and say, Hey, what's one of those people have a look at eternity. There's a radiance in their faces. I say, what, 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 what's happened to those folk? Huh? An English critic said he went outside of an English church and he said he watched people go in. They looked as though they were going to the dentist. He said, I waited an hour and they came out. I thought they'd been. I tell you again that if the Holy One, the Living One, the Christ of Glory came into our assembly, if He walks in our midst like He walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, we'd either go out so radiant, so on top of the world, with the world, the flesh and the devil beneath our feet and nothing would move us, or on the other hand we'd go our eyes swollen with tears that there are millions of people who could have this and they're going to eternal hell. Because there's no middle ground. Back to verse 8 in chapter 5. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and fallen twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps, notice that, 
and golden vials full of odors which are the prayers of the saints. Ah, the good book says that prayers never die. What are these under the altar, the prayers of saints? Keep this in mind, you younger folk, particularly God's delays are not denials. The schedule is his, not mine. Or the schedule, as you say. It's his. I'm not here to give him advice. He graciously, mercilessly says, Come unto me and, and lay your burden at my feet. But the timetable is his. They fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and vials, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals. Thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, so to a hell with communism. The world isn't going to end up in a communist state. I still believe there's going to be a super revival, a revival of Pentecost that will out Pentecost all Pentecost. But I'm quite sure of this, that the final word is with Jesus Christ. Yeah. And people are coming out of every kindred and nation and people and tongue. Yeah. Red, yellow, black, white, bondsmen, freemen, people living today, people that lived ten centuries back. So there's only ever been one church in the history of the world. Even with Israel, there was a church in the wilderness. And they sang a new song, because thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood of every kindred and nation and people and tongue, and hast made us kings and priests. Notice now, you that want to live on cloud nine with a guitar, and we shall reign on the earth. Uh huh. There's going to be a new heaven and a new. Oh. So we're going to live on this earth? Yeah, I believe we are. I believe God is going to return this world to a state of a perpetual, eternal Garden of Eden. God never designed sin to come in this world. Never designed that you should prick your finger on a rose or no thorns originally. You could catch the bees and they wouldn't sting you. You could get stroke a lion, it wouldn't hurt you. And we're going to rain on the earth. Oh, maybe we'll take excursions for the weekend if you want to go up to heaven or somewhere. I mean, the, the, you know... There's, because there's a new heaven as well as a new earth. Maybe there'll be a conference up there. You want to come and hear me preach? Well, that's okay. <laughs> I quite enjoy that. But you see, God never wastes anything. There's going to be a new heaven. There's going to be a new earth. We're going to be staggering one day. You, you see a procession going along and saying, Is that a Gabriel the Archangel? No, that's a little fellow that wasted his life, people thought, uh, up jungle tracks in, where? Amazon, Central Africa, got fevers and bitten with bugs and he was half crippled with rheumatism and like old C.T. Studd. And what's he doing now? He's ruling over five cities. <gasps> oh, he is, yeah. What's that big TV uh, guy doing, that big TV preacher? He's driving that preacher around. <laughs> because that's what it says. It says the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Some are going to rule over five cities. Some are going to rule over ten cities. Sure, the dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. Do you think he's going to have the same reward as John Wesley? John Wesley was saved at 35 years of age. Turn it round, it makes 53. Because he served God 53 years. 53 and 35 make 88, in case you didn't know. And he died at 88, and all he left was six pound notes, six silver spoons, a, a small collection of books, a Geneva gown he preached in. Something else, let's see, what was it? Oh, the Methodist Church. <laughs> knew there was something. I was suggesting the dying thief will have the same reward as John Wesley. He disciplined his life. He fasted always. You've got a Methodist preacher here, aren't you a Methodist preacher? Good bless you. I used to be, but I grew up. But anyhow, uh, <coughs> I remember talking in London, the big Methodist cathedral was right off Kitty Corner to Westminster Abbey. Dear Dr. Dr. Toz, I was going to say, Dr. Um, Sangster, Precious, one of the holiest men I've ever met. 
I had the privilege of talking with him, praying with him. And I discovered by accident he followed John Wesley's maxim. He, he, he fasted all day Wednesday and all day Friday, all his life, from the day he was saved. John Wesley did that. John Wesley disciplined himself. He rode through the forest and read with a, a, a book up to his eyes in the moonlight, riding on the back of a horse, don't know how he did it. Studied, prayed, fasted, made money, lots of it. What did he do with it? Built orphanages, built schools, printed Bibles, printed hymn books. Oh, you see, we get away with so much. Well, uh, the Lord loves me. <laughs> did not happen the other day? Did not somebody gave me, somebody sent me? So what? I don't care what you got. I don't have one streak of envy in my body. I covet no man's silver or gold or apparel. We were down a few weeks ago there with lots and lots of millionaires. I don't covet a thing they've got. Some have got their own planes, their own yachts, their this, that, this. So what? Let me ask you a simple thing. Maybe you have an answer to this. Did you, did you ever see a funeral hearse drawing a U-Haul? <laughs> you didn't get that. <laughs> did you ever see a hearse drawing a U-Haul? Can't take it with you. It doesn't matter how much it is, how big, how small, the value makes no difference. So a smart American, this isn't quite Shakespeare, but he says uh, about your money, do your giving while you're living, then you're knowing where it's going. <laughs> Not too smart, but it's pretty good anyhow. <laughs> hmm? They sang a new song, Thou hast redeemed us, such a God, by thy blood. My God, we've got a song nobody else can sing. Right. Doesn't matter about the tune very much. You know, I, I'm sure the Lord would rather hear you if you sing like a crow than hear Galligurchi or Pavarotti or somebody else sing faultlessly, singing their nonsense. Where do we get verse 10? And thou hast made us kings and priests, <coughs> and we shall reign on the earth. Now, and I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand, thousand, and thousands of thousands. Now, notice what it says. Verse 11, saying. Hmm? Do you know a place in... Any angel that lost its first estate was never redeemed. It never got back into favour with God. They are banished forever. They have no song to sing. They are going to sing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. They were saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory. And every creature, notice, that is in heaven or on the earth or under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are, uh, heard, uh, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Now, <clears throat> without looking, how does the last psalm finish? The 150th psalm. Huh? Yeah, but what's the exact word? Right, let everything, I'll give you a mark for that. Let everything that hath breath. Oh, well, that's just poetic license, you know. It's uh, what they call it, well, it's extravagance, or it's, again, poetic license. <coughs> no. <coughs> everything that hath breath, says the psalmist, praise the Lord. What has breath? Uh, every creature in heaven, on the earth, and such as are in the sea. Well, that'd be wonderful. I wonder what kind of tune a shark sings. <coughs> in a few weeks, maybe a few months, we'll have the things I detest buzzing around your ear. Yes, yeah. these horrible mosquitoes. And down here, the Texas size, you know, they're bigger than anywhere else. And they buzz and they buzz and, oh, when they bite me, man, I put weight on, I go up like this, I, I get in a terrible mess. I literally believe with all my heart that one day those things, every time they buzz in my ear, they'll be saying, hallelujah. <laughs> and they won't be able to sting me. 
Everything that has bread, can you imagine the whole of creation, every living bird, every, everything in the sea, if a fish comes up, it shouts hallelujah, praise the Lord or something. Everything that has bread, every kindred, every people, every nation, every tongue, are all going to join in the greatest hallelujah chorus the world's ever heard. And what are they going to say? They're going to say, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne. And the four beasts said, Amen. And again, the four and twenty elders fell down. That's three times. They must get tired of standing up and falling down. <laughs> but three times over in this, the, the end of the last chapter and this chapter, they fall down and they worship him. And then all the angels stood round about the throne, verse 11 of chapter 7, and about the elders, and they fell down before the throne on their faces, and they worshipped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto God forever and ever. Verse 14, I said, Sir, <coughs> pardon me, let's take verse 13. One of the elders said unto me, What are they, these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God. Now this must be a special honour to these who are martyred for Christ's sake. Therefore they are before the throne of God and they serve him day and night in his temple and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. Won't that be wonderful? Won't that be wonderful? This awesome moment in eternity can you think of those four and twenty elders that I wind this up? I, I've taken more time to write because I want to finish with it here. But to try and urge you to, to covet, to, to, to learn, to exercise yourself in, 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 in this particular devotion of worship. Take different aspects of the life uh, or the character of God. Gaze on his natural, you know, come before him not, not asking anything. Not, 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 not just to praise him, but gaze on his holiness. Gaze on his faithfulness. Think how many times he's been faithful, how many times you've let him down. How many times he's been faithful to his church. How many times he's brought out of tribulation. Think of what the church is going through tonight in China or going through in Russia and elsewhere. And yet he's standing by them then, he's getting saints out of them. He's maybe got more worship out of them today than he's got out of us. We've too many diversions, we've too many sight-tracking things. It's easy to sing it, isn't it? How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid to your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you, he has said. God has no afterthoughts, he has no corrections to make to his book. Men try to try and make it, but there's no, uh, no way to improve it. Quietness. Be still and know that I am God. Gaze on his faithfulness. Gaze on his holiness. Gaze on his love. Gaze on his purity. Think of some aspect of his character and dwell on it and, and let your soul get expanded and, and, and let's get into the business of knowing how to worship him here because for sure we're going to worship him hereafter. I've told a story before. Let, let's wind up with it. When Fanny Crosby was receiving some sympathy from somebody who said to her, well, you've been blind all your 84 years and it's a great pity and I don't know why the Lord let this happen. You've missed so much. Such a disadvantage to be blind. And dear little Fanny said it's a great advantage to be blind. Her friend said, what's the advantage? She said, my dear, don't you realize the first face I ever see will be his face? Isn't that a lovely way to look at it? You can't lose, you know, when you have a philosophy like that. You're missing everything. I'm missing nothing. I had a friend, he, could, he, he couldn't hear any more than a stone could hear. Tremendous preacher. Somebody said, why don't you ask God for healing? He said, because I don't want to be healed. You don't want to be healed? He said, no. I remember before I was deaf all the silly things Christians talk about and he said, I don't want to go back to that. <laughs> One way of looking at it, shut in with God, gazing on his boundless mercy, gazing on his love, realizing again we've got something that this world needs supremely 
We need the risen Christ of God who's exalted. He has all power. He has all authority. He has all dominion. Everything's under his feet. And he's going to come in splendor and he's going to come in glory. We do have some time for prayer. I want you to pray for, many of you know Bob Roberts. He's been here as a, a Baptist preacher. He's down in Belize right now and he's in a park. He's not in the city. I was asking Joe Foss about the city. He says, well, it's, it's a city. Though uh, the sewers run out of the house, down the sidewalks, the sewage comes down the street. But uh, Bob is working in a part up in the wilds, up in the woods, where there's still a lot of terrible superstition and witchcraft and darkness and heathenism. And we do need to pray for him. Last week I mentioned that the Calvary Commission is going in a few, I don't know, a couple of months, going up to New Jersey to help right down in, a, I don't know, it's Elizabeth, or one of the cities there, which is a, it's a hellhole, let me put it that way. And the pastor says, you, can you come and help me? And again, there'll be no love offerings. He's only got seven people coming to the church. So they're going up there. He hasn't got anywhere for them to sleep. I mentioned that last week and talked with Brother Joe on the phone. He said, you mentioned uh, about our group going up to New Jersey next uh, in, in a couple of months. I said, yes. He said, well, somebody left an envelope at last day's ministry. They just said on for, for New Jersey, Calvary Commission, and they left three $100 bills in it. Help pay their expenses. So I've got a special scripture for you tonight. Go and do thou likewise. <coughs> so you can get tax exemption if you want it. They really do need a bus. So they can crowd all the fellows in and take all the gear with them. It costs a few thousand dollars. And maybe the Lord will tell you to do something about that. You could help them in that way. Uh, let's pray. I was, I guess it's while we were down in the Bahamas. Somebody mentioned again Haiti. I'm not a bit against churches going and taking old clothes and food and what. Now that's good. But Lord help us. We've been doing that for 25 years. You know what? 97% of Haiti is Roman Catholic. And 95% of those Roman Catholics practice Roman Catholicism and Voodooism as well. That's double darkness as far as I'm concerned. Do you think we'll ever have a gang of young men that dare go down there and say, we're staying here, we're going to pray and fast and believe until we drive the devil off this island? Takes some doing. But the Lord said, greater works than these shall ye do. Think again of the, of the church in Korea. My goodness, when I go to bed at night now, I wonder why I'm in bed. Thousands of people, and they're praying that 10 million Japanese will be converted. Isn't that something? They've come out of darkness. I don't know any church around here that prays for 10,000. Do you know any church, any Methodists do that? Any Pentecostals? Any of our ministries around there? Anybody praying for, pardon me, 10 million? 10 million Japanese will be converted. That's, that's going Oh, there are some vast areas of the earth that still a total darkness. And we can help them and thank God for the help that goes, but it doesn't mean much really. It's a drop in a bucket. Maybe God's going to send a national awakening and provoke us. Just like old Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh. Lord, you're not going to bless the Gentiles and send them revival when we need it most of all. Huh? Say, if you're a Baptist, uh, could you pray for revival in the Pentecostal church down the street? And if you're a Pentecostal, could you pray for the Baptist to have it? I mean, are you so, so big that you don't care as long as it comes who God uses? I don't care who he uses. I want God to kind of, as we would say, wring the neck of the devil. I want God to so tramp him on the foot just, just once more before God comes in judgment. To come in mercy. To pour out his spirit. A revival that stops the traffic. <coughs> revival when the computers won't be used. 
Revival that will spread till, till every time you go into Sears, somebody singing, you know, uh, when all my labors are trials are o'er, or uh, <coughs> blessed assurance. You go in another shop and they're singing victory in Jesus or something. That's happened in revivals. But it's so far removed from what we do. And a lot of us really, we want things done decently and in order. Oh no, come on. We're moving up to Easter, isn't it wonderful? <clears throat> the stone was rolled away. Well, in case you don't know, the stone wasn't rolled away to let Jesus out. He was out a long while before that. The stone was open to let them go in and see it was empty. <clears throat> up from the grave he arose. It's amazing how dead churches can be with a living Christ, isn't it? I'm convinced again, and I mean this, I mean even the very physical atmosphere could vibrate. It did in the early church, it did after the day of Pentecost. They went, the whole place was shaken and they didn't run out scared and say, is this an earthquake, you're going to get hurt. <clears throat> and that has happened in revivals over and over again. I don't care a hill of beaners about any denomination. If they're pure, if they're preaching the word of God, well, just get, let God open the windows of heaven upon them. There's not much time left. Nobody's talking about abolishing nuclear war except a few fanatics in the eyes of other people. We're all suggesting about toning it down and not getting roasted too much, you know. You roast one of our, your cities and we roast one of yours and, and let's have a fair deal in this roasting business. Idiotic, isn't it? I've heard Christians say, I wish God had sent something and split Russia in two and killed a whole lot. In other words, what they're saying, I wish God had sent them all to hell. Because whether they're communists or anybody else, they're going to eternal darkness or eternal light. If you haven't taken the stars and stripes to the cross, you'd better bury it tonight. I took the Union Jack there about 60 years ago and I've never been back for it. I'm not an Englishman first and then a Christian. I'm a Christian first. I'd like God to do a lot for this country, otherwise I wouldn't have stayed here so long. I'd like God to do it for England. I'd like him to do it for other countries. Yeah. Yet once more, even Isaiah says, I will shake the heavens and the earth. Now there's not a lot of time left. I'll take more time because, and I intended to, to finish this message. But I wanted to pray tonight. Maybe you need to pray that for yourself, that you have no passion, that you have no vision. You're just concerned to go to church and be nice. Maybe you see again, what, are people that not long ago were heathens are now meeting all night, every night, praying every night for 10 million people to be saved in a country not far away from them. And there are other areas of the world that need the same thing. So forget the one next to you tonight, don't worry about them. Let me say this, in case I do forget, next week the meeting will begin at 7.30 because it gives more time for the folk here to get things straightened up. So will you remember that please? 7.30 next week. And by the grace of God we'll be here. So now let's go to prayer and please, please, just say, God, what do you want me to pray? You may want you to pray 10 words, you may want you to pray 10 minutes, but pray. Let's, believe, let's plead the blood, let's believe, resist the devil and see victory come in this day in which we live. Thank you.